World Spaceflight News Special Report. In terms of the post-launch performance summary that we had with the Space Launch System rocket, uh, I will simply say that the results were eye-watering. The, uh, the rocket uh, performed and or exceeded expectations. Everything was either on predict or off by less than 1%. In fact, it was off by less than 0.3% in all cases across the board. The, uh, the day of launch, we had the, uh, the solid boosters. They had a uh, propellant uh, bulk temperature of 77 degrees, which is well within the, the mid-range. It wasn't on the hot end like we had for the prior launch attempt, and it's certainly not on the cold end of what's tested. It was in the mid-range. The boosters performed as planned and as predicted. The core stage performed as planned and as predicted. Uh, the insertion altitude, we missed by three nautical miles. We, we planned on a uh, 972 by 16 nautical mile orbit. Uh, when you think about the uh, size of the system that we have and how much performance it puts out when the engines are at full throttle, we're producing two million pounds of thrust uh, out of the four RS-25 engines. The uh, core stage engine shutdown um, w missed by seven feet per second, which is simply remarkable. That is well within the, the uh, error and noise bands of the system. Uh, in terms of the uh, interim cryo propulsion stage, it, it was spot on in terms of the translunar injection as well as the uh, disposal. The RL-10 engine on the interim cryo propulsion stage set a record uh, for the uh, duration uh, for the translunar injection burn. It is the longest firing in the history of the RL-10 program at 18 minutes. Uh, there were no failures on the, uh, on the entire uh, Space Launch System stack, and there were five observations. Um, none of those are of consequence or of any particular uh, constraint to the, uh, the flight of crew. Um, all of the separation events, again, were um, as designed and as predicted. So again, we had eye-watering performance of the Space Launch System rocket. In terms of the ex uh, exploration ground systems performance, uh, we, we did uh, go all the way from the operations in the firing room to uh, the, uh, the activities at the launch pad and, and the mobile launcher and the pad itself. We reviewed all of those items. We do have some images here for you. Uh, first and foremost, the kinder, kindler and gentler loading operation uh, that we learned out of the, uh, out of the prior um, launch attempts performed as expected. Uh, the, the team operation was, was uh, great as well, um, and, uh, and, and we, we successfully executed the load there. Uh, the software for the launch control center and the handover of the command and control, again, uh, met all of our expectations. The ignition overpressure and sound suppression system uh, to uh, dampen the acoustic shock and, and keep the uh, deck of the mobile launcher um, uh, protected from the, uh, from the flames of the, uh, of the space launch system as it, as it lifted off, performed as expected. Uh, the mobile launcher umbilical releases were all within uh, specification and performed as expected. And the mobile launcher structure itself um, held up well and, and the structural inspections have all passed there. Uh, if we could roll the video of the drone footage of the mobile launcher, um, this will, is essentially a top-down look of the entire mobile launcher. And uh, this is the side that faces the, um, the rocket as it lifted off. You can see all the umbilicals in the retracted position. And we will go all the way down to the deck of the mobile launcher here. And, um, you know, we do have a, a little bit of discoloration simply from the heat of the rocket, but um, all of the interfaces uh, are, are in good shape. The uh, mobile launcher itself is, uh, it has a little bit of damage to it, but it will be ready to fly um, the uh, crewed launch on Artemis II. And here we are looking down into the flame trench. Uh, the damage that we did see uh, pertain to uh, really just a couple of areas um, on the zero deck. If, if we could pull up the, um, the image of the uh, elevator doors, we, we did, um, all right, so here we're seeing the image of the uh, mobile launcher deck. Uh, we have exhaust that comes out of the solid boosters that is right at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, we had a large amount of water come out of the water birds and the uh, water sound suppression system to, to keep the, the deck protected. You can see here that the uh, water sound suppression uh, did a great job with the exception of right around the edges of the flame trench. Uh, if we could go to the next photo. 
uh, and here you're simply seeing some of the paint, paint discolored and paint removed. This is the entire deck uh, of the mobile launcher and you see the two tail service mast umbilicals um, that, are, that are in the foreground on the right. Um, our, our launch director, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, says she walked into the, into the uh, tail service mast umbilicals and they were pristine inside. Uh, so all of the enclosures and, uh, and all of the uh, close up activities um, to, uh, to basically button this thing up as the rocket was lifting off, um, protected all the, all the hardware there. Uh, if we, there's our elevator doors. Um, the uh, elevator system is uh, not functioning right now. Uh, we, uh, we had the world's most powerful rocket and in and, and the pressure uh, basically blow the doors off of our elevators. Um, this is why it took a little longer uh, to inspect the, uh, the mobile launcher uh, is a very tall structure, and right now the elevators are inoperable, and we need to get those back into service. Uh, and then if we look at, at the next photo, um, I, I love this photo. Uh, when I saw it, I was like, wow. Um, this is one of the cameras on the zero deck and the mobile launcher uh, being looked at um, from the 274 foot level on one of the towers. So um, you can see, again, the heat of the uh, boosters um, scorching the camera. The camera uh, housing survived, but uh, it just goes to show the environment there on the, on the, on the zero deck um, is, is not the friendliest when, when you have the world's most powerful rocket lifting off. Um, again, that said, we did um, a thorough inspection of the mobile launcher and it, is, it has passed. They're the only items that are noteworthy of damage are the ones that, that uh, I've, I've shown you there. We did have two cameras out. We also did have um, some damage to uh, pneumatic lines associated with uh, gaseous nitrogen and gaseous, gaseous helium. And um, that in turn caused the uh, oxygen sensors on the pad to show that there were low oxygen readings until we got the, uh, until we got the uh, leaks in the pneumatic lines isolated, which is why it took a little longer to gain access out of the pad. Um, in terms of, uh, did we find any flight items? You don't want to find flight items at the, at the pad, right? Uh, in terms of did we find flight items, we found two. Uh, the first was uh, the booster throat, pr throat plug material, which uh, is purposefully um, uh, expelled from the throat of each booster uh, at liftoff when, when the boosters ignite. Uh, and we did find that in the pad perimeter. Um, we did need a little bit of time to map that out. That is a very normal thing, finding the blue booster throat plug material. And then we did find one piece of the, um, the uh, 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 RTV material from the Orion spacecraft. It is unclear whether that was actually liberated during launch or whether that was uh, released during the, during the hurricane, uh, but it was found on the infield. So overall, uh, again, a very clean uh, system. The, uh, the exploration ground systems uh, exceeded our performance. We did have a little bit of damage and the, and the mobile launcher will be ready to support um, uh, Artemis II and we had accounted for that uh, previously in our, in our replan and our budget um, for uh, uh, the time between Artemis 1 and 2.